All right. Class two is important um, because it's, it's the gospel. And you might think that's sort of self-evident. But if you spend much time in the church and you spend much time talking to Christians, you'll find out not everybody has the same idea of what is the gospel. You know, we don't live the gospel. Christ did that. <laughs> we, we, we follow him. We believe the gospel, but the gospel is him. So what is the gospel? Did I intimidate you until you don't want to share? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Love more than that. Yeah, absolutely. The gospel does mean, if you look at the word in Greek, it does mean good news, but good news about what? Or maybe I should say good news about who? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you, wanted to take the, if you want to take the gospel down to one word, it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is the gospel. So it's the good news about Christ. Michael Horton says this, from Genesis to Revelation, the gospel is God's promise of a son who would crush the serpent's head, forgive the sins of his people, raise them from the dead, and give them, over, give them everlasting life solely on the basis of his grace for the sake of Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, God's promise of his son who would crush the serpent's head, forgive his people's sin. Save His people. Deliver us from sin and the condemnation our sin deserves. From death into life. Eternal life begins here flowing into um, eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. If you're not familiar with it, the first gospel is Genesis 3.15 where the seed is promised that will crush the serpent's head. And they immediately started looking for Him. you know, And then everything between there and the incarnation, the Christ, his birth in a manger, was typifying him and picturing him and prophesying him so that we would recognize him when he came. It is a whole Bible revelation of the gospel in the Old Testament in types and shadows and prophecies and symbols in the New Testament in reality in Christ. So Romans 6.23 is a really good Lord, just little encapsulation of what we should know. If we're preaching the gospel or teaching the gospel or sharing the gospel, embracing the gospel, we've seen from our study in Romans that the proclamation of the bad news is part of preaching the gospel. Paul said according to his gospel in chapter 2 of Romans, he preached judgment. So Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. The payoff for sin is death. The very thing God promised Adam and Eve in the garden, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die, Right? Did they die? Yes and no, right? God was patient and gracious with them, but they, spiritually they died the moment they sinned. Physically, death would come as a result of that. The soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. Death there. Spiritual death. Physical death. Uh, separation from God. Condemnation for our sin. Hell. Eternal, do I believe it's eternal? Yeah, do I wish it? I don't, you know, yeah, we would struggle with that, but it's true. I mean, Christ, y'all know Christ talked more about wrath than he did about love, talked more about hell than he did about heaven. It's a real danger. But we, our sin is an offense to a holy and a righteous God. It's, it's something that he must judge, and he will judge, either in us or in a substitute. So the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is hell. We deserve condemnation. We're born under condemnation. Naturally speaking of ourselves, we, we seek to live there. We won't come into the light because our deeds are evil, Jesus said in, in 319. But if God's at work in His grace, if the Spirit attends the preaching of the gospel such that through that preaching of the gospel He grants us life, we're regenerated, we're, we're brought to life, then we will follow with faith and repentance and receive the free gift. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
He requires repentance and faith and He grants it through the preaching of the gospel. And we receive, we turn and trust and receive Christ as a free gift. We don't have to clean up our act first. We don't have to do a certain amount of works to earn it. It's not justification by faith plus works. It's a free gift. It's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord who died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that's the next slide. Paul reminding the Corinthians of the gospel that he preached is giving them a nutshell summary. Whereas in Romans he gives this expansive layout of the, of the gospel. Here he gives a summary of the gospel that he preached. And he says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And when he says scriptures there, we're talking about Old Testament scriptures. Right? In accordance with all that was predicted. He was buried. He went under the power of death for a time. He was actually in that grave. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And the resurrection is the proof that he is who he said he was and will do what he said he would do. But Christ is the gospel. You can see it there. You can preach the gospel from here. You know, you can, you can come here and say, uh, this is the gospel Paul preached. Christ died. Stop. Christ. Who is Christ? You can explain Messiah, Son of God. And then it says he died. Why did he die? You can backtrack. Law, sin, need, wrath, need for a Savior. For our sins, substitutionary, pictured by all those sacrifices in the Old Covenant. In accordance with what was predicted and pictured, <coughs> he was buried, he was raised. Same thing, in accordance with the Scriptures. The suffering servant would come before the conquering king, and, and Jesus, the Messiah, would come and die and pay the penalty for his people's sins and be raised from the grave before being the conquering king. He is king now, as you saw as we read uh, Matthew 28, the, the Great Commission. He's reigning now to see his gospel go to the ends of the earth, and he's coming again. And when he's coming, it will be to conquer, to judge, to set up his kingdom in the new heaven and the new earth. So, but the gospel is Christ, his doing. He lived, his, his positive righteousness is important. He lived in fulfillment of his own law that he would have a righteousness to give his people. He died to pay the penalties for our sins so that when we come to faith in Him and are united with Him and justified in Him. It's on the basis of His righteousness credited to us. And all of our sins are taken away by His atonement or death for us. All of salvation is a work of grace, to Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. When it says right here, the, the, it is the gift of God, um, it's really talking about the entire grace by faith salvation, including faith. So it's not excluding faith, but it's not limiting it to faith. The entire salvation is a gift to us in Christ Jesus. The, like I've said before, the repentance and faith that He cry, requires, He grants, He gifts. We repent and trust Christ because we've been born again, not in order to be born again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, He did it, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God commanded beforehand that we should walk in them. So Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the grave. That being presented to us, God demands a response from us. I, mean, I use that word demand intentionally. If you go and look at um, Acts chapter 17 and the end of the chapter, what does it say God, God does? On the basis of His gift of... I'm, I'm paraphrasing. On the basis of His gift of His Son and His life, death, burial, and resurrection, He commands all people everywhere to repent. Don't suggest it. Doesn't encourage it. Doesn't present it as a good idea. He commands repentance and faith. And that's what we call conversion in that next slide. Conversion is repentance and faith. And repentance and faith are 
sort of if you picture a coin with heads, coin with heads and tails, that's just two sides of the same coin of conversion. You, we can delineate the two, but we can't separate the two. Without either one of them, you don't have true conversion. There's not even much talk of repentance these days in the contemporary church. Sad. Christ said we were to preach repentance to the ends of the earth. Sometimes the, the word will, will use one uh, and not use them both. But whenever repentance is used, faith is implied. Whenever faith is used, repentance is implied because conversion is repentance and faith. Repentance is, a, repentance is a change of heart that results in a change of action. A change in the direction of the soul. A change in the life. The whole entire life. Moving from unbelief to belief. From rebellion to submission. From love of sin to hatred of sin. So God renews us in the entirety of our being. In repentance so that we turn from from sin to Christ, receive Christ, but it doesn't end there. The, the Christian life is a life of daily repentance, of growth and grace, of turning more and more from sin to obedience, loving obedience to Christ and trusting. I mean, there's catechism. There's a lot of things we could use. But um, John called those he was preaching to, this, I'm talking about John the Baptist, said to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And the changes, of the deeds were the fruit that flows from true repentance, from the change of heart that is produced by God when we're, when we're born again. We get a, a new heart, the one that's re responsive to God, one that's not a heart of stone that's irresponsive to God, but a, a new heart. We get His Spirit, His law, refreshed on that heart and so that we begin to rejoice in it and live in it and grieve over our sin and confess it and grow more and more like Christ. You know, sometimes repentance is preached or taught as though it is just a change of mind. <clears throat> it is that, but it's more than that. Because if you really have a true change of mind, change of heart, right, then it's going to show up in the life, and it'll show up in joyful obedience to God. So sometimes repentance is, is, is talked about in the, the heart change but other times it's, it's talked about in the life change and it's really encompassing those two. Well, yeah, a new heart results in a new life. We've been raised with Christ to newness of life. What is that newness of life? It's joyful obedience to Him and growing in it. It's hatred of sin and confessing and seeking to be free from it. We'll be glorified. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be done repenting when we're glorified. There won't be anything else to repent of when, when we're glorified. When we, when we die and go to be with Christ, our spirits will be purified. There will be no more sin. If He comes back before we die, we'll be resurrected body, glorified, made like Him. No more sins of thought, word, and deed. But until then, it's a life of repentance. But conversion is that initial repentance and faith that involves turning to and receiving Jesus. Um, faith, faith is more than, uh, than intellectual assent. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but the Reformers talked about saving faith in three ways. There's three elements to a true and saving faith. First one is knowledge of the facts of the gospel. You, know, you got to know the gospel. I mean, you, you know, nobody's going to be saved without that gospel. So it's knowledge of the facts of the gospel. Second element of saving faith is assent or belief that those facts are true. Are we saved yet? Why? Well, the devil goes that far. Right? The devil knows what the gospel is. The devil knows it's true. He knows Christ died and was buried and was raised from the grave. But that third and essential element of true saving faith is trust. It's trusting in Christ and Christ alone. It's a giving of one's soul to Christ and hope in Him for salvation. So knowing the gospel, believing it's true, and turning, trusting in Him for salvation. It is a gift of God. It is not a result of works. But our, our, our response, our proper response to the gospel is repentance and faith. 
So that next slide simply lays out for you what I was just saying. True and saving faith is knowledge of the facts of the gospel. Assent to these facts are true and trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. You become a Christian the moment you trust Jesus alone as your Savior. And you trust Jesus because God's at work in you. Jesus said that unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. So you don't believe in order to be born again. You're born again by God's operation. Wind blows here and there. You can't tell where it's going. All those analogies he used. But through the preaching of the gospel, God, as he called Lazarus out of the grave, he calls you out of the grave. He grants you life such that you turn and trust in Christ. Repentance and faith are evidences and fruit of being born again, not the root. I'm bleeding over into the theology class, though. More important question is not when you were saved, but are you trusting Christ right now? A lot of times we can share our testimony or present things in such a way that, that, that almost make non-dramatic conversion a second-class citizen. But a lot of people were raised in a Christian home. They don't remember when they didn't trust Christ. They don't remember when they came to faith in Christ. Right? As I stand here right now, I wish that would, would have been my testimony. I'd have brought a lot less baggage into the Christian life if that had been my... It wasn't. I was converted at 26. And it was a rather dramatic conversion. Um, but boy, there's a lot of... There's a lot of more stuff to be rooted out of the heart and habits when it's, when it's later like that. So when we're doing interviews, when we're talking to you about membership... We don't, I mean, we love to hear it, but we don't spend as much emphasis on what happened to you in the past. We want to know what you are now. Just like the qualifications for elder. You know, there was a time when I was pugnacious. I mean, I'm missing knuckles and stuff. But God converted me. That's not how I am anymore. And so when you're interviewing a man for deacon and elder, you want to know mainly, what is he now? Wife, what is he now? Husband, what are you now? You know? So my, my concern is more, are you trusting in Christ and Christ alone right now than what has happened to you? I mean, it's valuable and it's wonderful to hear the testimony of how it happened. But if you are a Christian, you'll be trusting in Christ and Christ alone as you sit in the seat now. Grace alone through faith alone. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So the last slide really is just asking you a question. Is your testimony that you have turned and from sin, if you're repented and trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that you've received and are rested, resting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? In other words, is all your hope, in Je not in what you are and what you do, but all of your hope in Jesus Christ for your salvation? If so, you're a Christian and you're welcome to join Grace Church. And then I just had on here the, one of my other favorite quotes of John Newton. He was getting old and he didn't remember much, but he said, I know two things. I remember two things. I am a great sinner and he's a great savior. So I'll end that with this section with those words. Um, comments or questions? It's all kind of straightforward so far. Tell everybody your name. Not everybody knows you. Mark. Mark. Yeah, yeah. Faith and repentance right there, practically. Yeah. Um, second off, on when you talk about the gospel, most of it, which I'm glad you finally said, I was afraid you weren't going to say it was about um, Christ was going to law on our behalf. But yeah, the positive focus, righteousness. Yeah. Your focus was on forgiveness of sin. Yeah. And I was just thinking, using that coin, the coin would be like a double amputation. You can't have one without the yeah. other. Christ came to fulfill the law, Matthew 5 yeah. 17. That's what follows you. That goes back to the covenant of works. Yep. So you have it. So you have to yep. have Christ fulfill the law on your behalf. Yep. One side of the coin plus his forgiveness for sin. On the other, which is the double imputation, the definition of justification. 
what, what theologians, theologians often call the active and passive obedience of Christ. So that, I mean, that slide could be sharpened in that nature to emphasize the fact that you need both. The passive, and it, you know, I've never been a big fan, fan of passive. Uh, you know, he wasn't totally passive, but I, I get why you use that for his death on the cross his active obedience for his life of fulfilling all righteousness or, or obeying the, the scripture. So, yes, we need both. We need, uh, we need his righteousness credited to us. That, that's the basis on which God declares us righteous. It's nothing of us. It's Christ's righteousness credited or, or credited to us. So I appreciate that. appreciate you bringing that out more fully. All right. Let's take a break. Get, get a water, get a drink, go to the bathroom um, if you need to. Uh, and we'll talk a little, give us some highlights of the theology of the church.